Hey church, we're in the finale of our series on the Ten Commandments. So we are here today to finish off uh, the Ten Commandments according to Jesus, part 10, and it is the tenth one. Why don't I start off by reading it to you first, because it's a bit longer than the others that we've had this last few weeks. Uh, but it's quite descriptive, and this is going to set us on a path that is going to lead us to be more happy uh, leaving this message than when we arrived here this morning. So I pray that this command blesses you, and that as we learn the ethics that Jesus then throws in on top of it, the lens to which we should see this as not just a command to be followed, but one to permeate to our hearts so that we can live to the fullest that God has given us. So why don't we read it here right now? It is the 17th verse of the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his maidservants or manservants, nor his oxen, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. So what is coveting? Well, it is a form of envy. Coveting is that you want what somebody else has. Now, what coveting is not is when you actually need something. If you're starving and somebody has ample food, uh, that, you know, that's just a, it's a human need. But if you just see someone else who has something that is nicer than yours or that, uh, that is something that you want but you don't have, um, that, can, that is what we call envying and coveting. It does not mean justice issues either. If somebody is being oppressed and has nothing, no, we need to fix justice issues. We do need to make sure that people are uh, in need, that get help. But we're just actually talking today about the covetedness of just you have stuff, but you want more. And you like what other people have, and what you have isn't good enough. And that is a cancer in our soul. Because as long as we're chasing after other things, we're never going to enjoy what we have. And so that, this, therefore, getting onto this is that what coveting actually is, is it's taking us, distracting us from our life that we're currently living and distracts us from uh, where God wants us to go. And the first thing to point out is that uh, a negative consequence of coveting is it makes our heart a bit harder. That as we are uh, wanting what someone else has, we start to resent that person for it. Uh, even arrogance can hide in coveting. We can think, well, we deserve that more than they do. And, uh, and therefore, we might end up having hidden pride as to why we covet what somebody else has, if they have fairly uh, gained what they have done. Now, for those of us that have goods in the world, we're supposed to be generous with those. So let's make sure that if, even though we may have some things, that we're not holding on to them too tight. Uh, but back to coveting. It causes resentment in, uh, of us to another person, which then devalues that person in our eyes, and that person is made in the image of God. So envying is really tearing down the other person and making you bitter while all along the way. Uh, God wants to free us from that kind of thinking. And so as we go and see that other people have different things than us that are different, I'm going to give you a whole lot of tips on how we should go about doing the opposite of coveting and how we can have a purposeful and happy life with the things that God has given us. When covetousness has reached full blown, and we have done the opposite of what we should to uh, rejoice with that person in their victories, that if we've devalued them and resented them, that we may end up rejoicing when they run afoul and have to sell their beloved possession or whatever hardship comes their way, that we might end up rejoicing. And we should never want to rejoice at the downfall of someone else. As we learn in Proverbs 25 or 24, uh, we learn that we should not rejoice when our enemy fails, when our enemy stumbles. How much more so should we not rejoice when our neighbor has a difficult year and might have to sell their precious possessions. We should be there for one another and not care about such material things. We are spiritual people, not material people. And on top of that, we need to understand too that comparison kills. Comparison, uh, you know, we compare lots of things in life when we're weighing what kind of cereal you're gonna buy at the grocery store or whatnot. But when it comes to a covetedness of comparing, what it can do is it kills. It kills our relationship with the people around us because we're no longer satisfied. We want uh, the nicer spouse. We want the nicer car. We want the nicer house. And this is exactly what this command talks about. It's about spouses and stuff. And so with that, when you compare what you have that is amazing with somebody else's that might be in your eyes a little bit better, you've completely thrown away and you're not going to be able to even use what you have with any great joy. Let me tell you a little story about this that is a true story that happened in our family business about 22 or so years ago. There's two friends who ended up getting a job at our company, and they were both uh, working away and doing well. They were good hard workers, and they were paid appropriately for it. And uh, well, the one guy, he uh, moved away and came back uh, six months later. But in that meantime, this other guy who stayed ended up getting a small raise. And they ended up finding out about it. He really just did not like that he did not uh, make the same amount of money as this guy anymore. And he really, really wanted to make what the other guy was making and was really upset with his own income. Well, in, in due time, 
uh, it came time for raises, and this other person who had remained there the whole time got another certification on some piece of equipment, so they got a raise. Uh, the other person didn't know about it, but this person got a raise to what was that old person's salary. So he thought, he was so happy that he now makes as much as the other guy. And he was so thrilled with the dollar an hour, uh, the, the hourly wage that he was given. Absolutely thrilled. It's what he wanted. It would allow him to have the lifestyle that he wanted. And he was really happy with it. And as he's going skipping down uh, back out into the warehouse, the first thing he does is he tells his friend that, hey, I now make as much as you do. And his friend basically broke the news and said, no, you don't. I make, it was only $2 more, $2 an hour more. Well, that, that wage that he loved on the way out to the warehouse was completely thrown away because his friend made just a little bit more. So certainly he had free reign to go talk about how much he made, and so did the other guy. Um, but it, what happened is as soon as he compared what he previously loved, and it came up short, very little uh, compared to the, someone else, the difference. And he threw it all away, and he was miserable after that. Comparison kills. If you, if you loved what you had when you got it, keep loving it still. In Proverbs chapter 5, uh, even Solomon is talking about this because he made this mistake himself. And he said, to love the wife of your youth. And in this, this particular one, he's warning his sons against adultery, to which he was the greatest adulterer of all time. And he said, you know what? Don't go down that alley. Just fall back in love with the woman of your youth and uh, of the wife of your youth, and you will be satisfied. And uh, so he tried to satisfy himself in any way possible in that regard, and he came up short. And so with that, you might think that there's greener pastures somewhere else by doing comparisons. But if you invest that energy into love and to rekindle relationships, you'll find out that you just might have the best relationship possible. We believe that God is a good God who can uh, match us up and he can restore anything. He can restore marriages, fortunes, whatever that may be. So let us put our effort back into who are we? What do we have? And let's reinvest back into that instead of spending our energy resenting somebody else for what they have and envying uh, what somebody else has that you might even devalue your own treasured belongings, including beloved family members. So I encourage you this, comparison kills. Watch yourself when you see that that is taking over inside of you. Watch when you see that there's a resentment that I should have that, not that guy. How come they have that and not me? Uh, let us not go down that road. If it's not a justice issue or a need issue and it's just about coveting, may we recognize it and eliminate that because it is totally taking us off where we need to be. And next we talk about greed. Greed is connected to all of this as we want more. And greed is something that is uh, profoundly spoken against very harshly in the Bible. In fact, talking about that the greedy will not inherit eternal life. You know, we think of like murderers and, uh, and slanderers and things like that as being evil. But the fact of being greedy, where we want more uh, than what we may have uh, in, in a negative way, that, that's, that's crazy. You should want the proper amount of food and clothing and housing and whatnot, but not in a greed that you want to hoard to yourself and not look after others. For example, I would say this, you know, we, the fact that you can covet means that people have different things. So the Bible isn't preaching communism. Uh, the Bible's preaching us to be industrious, seek justice, and to help others along the way. We should also note that uh, I, I run into people who are upset that the billionaires actually exist. Like, well, we have a world market now, so gaining a penny from every person um, is a lot easier than it was so long ago. And I simply say this, well, if we don't want billionaires, then don't give them your, your money. Don't buy the latest iPhone, things, things along those lines. And let's seek justice to make sure that people aren't gaming the system, not just uh, rail against them just because they have things. And if, because people all around the world could blame us for being greedy because we have a lifestyle here in Canada that is unmatched. Like the fact that we have security, like that we can go down the street and reasonably believe that we're not going to be mugged. Uh, and a worst case scenario, they're just going to take some of the stuff on our belongings that can be replaced. Uh, many places around the world, when you're robbed, you're severely beaten, raped, or killed. And uh, we, just, we just don't see that here. We see that we have food banks, even for those who have nothing. And we have shelters, and we have uh, lots of government programs, and uh, Medicare. Most of the world over, they only get treatment for things like cancer when it is readily known in stage four. We need to be praising God that we can be, have such a system that uh, allows us to live longer than everybody else. And, but we need to ask ourselves, are we being greedy as a nation? Should we open up the floodgates of immigration to allow people to come here and to receive some of the blessings that we have? Um, that's a good question for us to ask, even as just middle-class folks. We have uh, mega-class things in the rest of the world in comparison. And so let us not look to the rich and wonder what they're not doing and even ask ourselves 
you know what, if you're a Canadian and have $10 in your pocket and a roof over your head, even if you're not an owner or even the renter, you're just living there, you are wealthier than 90% of the entire world. So let us not be greedy. Let's seek ways of how we can give justice and life to people in this world all around the globe. And, uh, and so the opposite of uh, greed, which greed's attached to coveting, and we've already learned that greed uh, is the opposite of the generosity that God wants to be with us. God is not greedy. God is generous, and he wants us, if we're made in his image, to be like him in that character. So we should be seeking ways to bless. So I will say this to the business owner who has done well, don't go by just market factors. You know, yes, you might be able to hire an employee at a certain rate and charge at a certain dollar just because the market allows for it. We are Christians. I do believe in free market, but I believe in compassionate and Christian free market, which means if I was a business owner and I had a bumper year, should I look to, uh, even though I was able to get away with paying people a certain amount, should I give bonuses for this performance? Should I lower some prices for the consumers of my product because I've done very well? How can I spread the blessing? Can I give more to the mission field? You know, God gives us things so that we can be a revolving door of blessing. Count it amazing that God has included us in his plan to get blessing out around the world. That's why we have stuff to begin with. So not only do we not covet uh, what others have, we don't even covet what we have. Let us be uh, quite a bit more generous in our thinking and hold things loosely. In fact, even the whole book of Ecclesiastes, which Solomon also wrote, he concluded with, you know, work hard, love the Lord, and enjoy the days that God has you under the sun. And because all the toil that we can do, don't go chasing things. Life is not just about things. It's about people, and it's about our God. And so this is why, uh, out of all these Old Testament references that I have given you, and it, it, it nails down to this, that coveting, the opposite of coveting, is seeking God. And God knows he put us in a material world. He knows we need stuff. And this is why Jesus addressed this very thing. This particular verse has come up quite a few times in uh, this series. And we're going to go into Matthew chapter 6 right now. I encourage you to uh, read along with, get used to using your Bible. Uh, it helps you to flip through and remember Scripture easier if you're flipping through versus just waiting for what comes up on the screen, although that's convenient for you for now. Uh, yeah, at the end of this, I always have the, uh, our videographer, Kevin. He always puts up all the Scripture references. I encourage you to hit pause when that comes up and flip through and get used to using your paper Bible. There may be a day when um, we don't have a power, in it, but we'll always have the paper in front of us. And by flipping back and forth and even taking notes helps us to remember God's word so it can help us to apply it in times where we don't have access to the word of God. So let's read Matthew uh, chapter 6 here right now, these famous words of Jesus Christ. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not so much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So don't go around saying, uh, worrying, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So he states here that the non-believers covet, they run after these things. It's the vision for their life is to acquire and gain possessions. Jesus already taught us, and I have already mentioned it in this series, uh, that we are not to uh, amass for ourselves fortunes on earth and realize that we're given to them for a purpose, and we need to employ them for God's use, and it will be for our ultimate glory as well as his. And so ultimately, the covetousness, Jesus says, don't build up for yourself treasure on earth that what moths uh, will eat, that rust destroys, and thieves come in, break, and steal, that we should be building ourselves up treasure in heaven. That is what we should be doing. So when we covet things on earth, we are literally uh, apart from the purpose in life, which is to build treasure in heaven. That's actually kind of a bit of a selfish pursuit that Jesus told us. He's telling them, if you do some stuff here, you can get yourself some rewards that can last a lot longer than your few trips uh, around the sun here on the earth. If you do these things, you're going to be blessed with more things forever and ever. So even if someone was covetous, you would think, maybe I should just dump everything into the kingdom of God so that I have that forever versus uh, just the little bit that I have here today. So as I read to you that, that there's all kinds of uh, scriptures against greed, there's all kinds of scriptures against coveting, and not to be a finger wagging uh, Jesus, but he's wanting us to live a real life because those things bog us down. 
It's funny that many people in our country don't even feel that they are wealthy. And the reason is, is that whenever we have an increase in funds, we have an increase in liabilities. And so we never have the financial freedom because the average Canadian spends what they make and they have no idea how to live underneath what they actually make so they could be more generous and more relaxed. There's a point that we understand that somewhere between 60 and $75,000, any penny you make more than that can't make you happier. You might be able to buy more exciting things for a time, but your wellness, once your basic needs are taken care of, uh, wealth and things just do not satisfy. These are studies around the world that shows that. And, uh, and so with that, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to see, seek and look at your life and how can I be happy with what I already have? So this is the do's. What do we do about all this? So we know it's wrong. We know that Jesus wants us to be free. We know he wants us to be on mission. What do we do in the face of all this? And ultimately, stop, look around, and thank God for everything that you have. Thank God that we live in the time and place that we do. Like, we really don't understand. The fact that we live in this year, in this country, like untold billions throughout history never had it even close to this good. Thank you, God, that you have given us peace. Thank you that we have Medicare. Thank you that we have so much, Lord. And we pray that we will be able to be more thankful day by day. So start being by thankful. Start loving what you have. Start, stop comparing uh, your family to other families. Stop comparing your job to other jobs. If you have a job that's putting food on the table, God bless you. If you've got an old rundown car that's getting you from A to B, rejoice and thank God for that. And a thankful heart and a cheerful heart is one that God loves and that he will then ultimately bring the blessing. How would God want to bless financially someone who is covetous? Think about that. If you knew someone who is greedy and covetous that's uh, uh, in your family and you're making your will, you're really not going to want to give that to them because you know it's going to set them on fire to go even worse. So ultimately, we can, I don't say attract God's blessing because it sounds like I'm selling the gospel. I'm not. But, but God is looking for people to bless spiritually as well as to rise up to places of influence for his purpose. So if we want to have an increase in God, we must have a decrease in ourselves and with sin. And if we are a covetous person, God's not going to bring the promotion to us. Uh, why would he? That would only hurt us even more. And so with that, don't compare with other people. Enjoy what you have. Thank God for what we have and give lots of thanksgiving because you know what? We could even have less than what we currently do. And we don't want to tempt God to have to correct us in that manner to discipline us even further. The next is to seek justice and to do mission. You know, we know that some people uh, have wealth and you shouldn't be covetous of it even if they have it by being uh, a tyrant. No, we must pray for that person that God would reach them. We pray that uh, even their progeny would become righteous and do what is right. And we pray that lawmakers make just laws so that people have the equal opportunity to work hard uh, and to gain upward mobility. So we want to seek justice and we want to seek mission, those who are without, uh, so that they can have an opportunity to get ahead as well. And don't covet along the way. Just address the income equality issues in our world without uh, devaluing the person that has the goods. Because again, they're made in the image of God. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for ourselves because we are the rich in Canada. Let us pray that we can use our gifts in a generous manner that has nothing to do with coveting of one another. And being even uh, the persons who God has put us in our life, let us rejoice and thank God for our families. You might think that it's, it's interesting because particularly teenagers, I've worked with a lot of teenagers over the years, and teenagers will go to somebody else's house and be on their best behavior instinctively. And then, uh, but when they're home, they drive their parents crazy. And uh, you, many of you are probably laughing. I did that as a teenager too, so no judgment on anyone. Uh, and the fact is, is that we know we can be relaxed around the people that we love and who will always forgive us. And, uh, but what ends up kind of happening is then you can even have parents go, well, how come you're not well behaved like this kid? Uh, no, that's, you, you, you have an, your coveting is coming from a lack of knowledge. You don't actually realize that both kids are exactly the same and they both do the same thing. And they're just, they're just kids, cut them some slack. And so with that, some of our coveting, we might think that something is actually better when it's actually just the same. It might even be worse. We don't really know. Let us pray and rejoice for what God has given us. He's smart. He knows how to build our lives. And let us be happy. So ultimately, too, those who have uh, gained success in this world through proper uh, gain, you know, what, what the Bible talks about when it comes to income equality is people that are harsh, people that get ill-gotten gain, meaning they sin in order to gain it. But there's actually quite a bit of praise for those who are hardworking and uh, have ingenuity. And uh, those are often praised people. And people that, are, that gain wealth uh, like that in, in a just manner are often just people and share it readily. 
So we shouldn't worry just because somebody has some funds, but we need to make sure uh, that we can be inspired by them. If you see somebody with a real nice car, do you go, oh, I wonder who they shafted to get to that? Um, or do you think, wow, they must have worked hard in order to get that? Maybe if I, I wonder what I could learn some lessons from them so that I can make my efforts more effective. And so with that, as we get inspired by other people, if we get inspired by people who uh, have achieved what we are longing for, don't get bitter about it. In fact, the opposite should happen. We should, I don't say admire them because we don't put people on pedestals, but let someone else's success inspire you. You know what, I look around as a church pastor, I wanna make sure that we get the gospel to everyone. So I check around to see what other people might be doing in case there's something that I've missed that I could do at this church that others are doing at other churches. And when I find someone has done well and their ministry is succeeding, I praise the Lord because they're bringing people to the Lord. And then I can use some of their information. I'll send them a shout out to say, thank you for teaching me this. And then we go on a merry way. Let other people's success uh, let you be an inspiration. We're supposed to uh, mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. Everybody knows how to mourn with those who mourn. But do we know how to rejoice with those who rejoice while we're waiting for our turn? Sometimes a turn seems to take quite some time. Maybe our gifting isn't suited for wealth gain. So I don't want this to be about wealth. I want you to understand about coveting. It could be spiritual gifts. And the thing that you should want, you should equally desire but not covet, is gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we may bless this world. Because uh, the Christian is a gift to the world. We really are. That is how God has designed it. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. Jesus was a gift to us. And uh, we are a gift to the world to help them so we can break the chains of injustice, so that we can make sure that everybody's got an equal shot and that we can work hard with our hands and enjoy the fruit of our labor and all the days that God has under us, us under the sun while we rejoice in his creation with varied things and we celebrate with those who achieve more than us and we help those who have not achieved as much as we have and we continue on this with Christian charity and delight. Let us be inspired. Let us love one another. Let us rejoice and let us not covet because it takes us down. Doesn't that sound like such a better picture where we can rejoice with those who rejoice and that we can be equal and have a great opportunities amongst each other? Uh, that just sounds like a brilliant society. And, and I pray that as, uh, as we uh, seek to engage the mission of Jesus Christ, that more people would pick up on this simple blessing uh, that is the gospel message, that God made a perfect world. Oh man, it was perfect. Can you imagine how easy it was? You want to talk about coveting? Maybe I think I covet the, the perfect world more than, more than I ought to. And that it was perfect, but humanity botched it. And we're the offspring of those original sinners. So we have some of that in us, which is why we have a bent to do things not God's way. And but God could have left us in the mess that we created, but he didn't. He sent his son and he lived and he died according to the scriptures and was raised again according to the scriptures three days later and where he bought the forgiveness of sins and where he has set us free and given us his Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 says that he's given us the Holy Spirit for times of refreshing, not only just the agent of salvation, but the Holy Spirit to walk with us. So I pray that if you have not made a decision to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, that you would do so. It's simple by just acknowledging in your heart that yes, Jesus, you died for me and I'm going to follow you. Please help me by the power of your Holy Spirit to, to be born in your likeness as each day goes by. That is simple to say, it's hard to live. So let us know that this gift of Jesus Christ is readily available to everybody. You don't have to be uh, uh, good for so long in order to then get it. You can receive him right now. And I pray that you do so. And as for those who have already believed, let us engage our faith. Let us learn from these 10 commandments to not covet, to take the cancer out of our soul that is of envying of others and devaluing them. And then rejoice when people do well and that we together seek justice uh, and humanitarian issues to be solved in this world. And what a world it will be if we can keep on keeping on. Well, thank you for being the church. And as we have learned today what this last commandment means, may we go out from here uh, beaming with just this joy that God has given us a law that brings us to life, that brings us a prosperity, both spiritual and here on the earth, and that he, bring, he also gives us life with relationship. So go enjoy the relationships and the things that God has given you today as you go out from this church to be the church where it needs to be. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you. 
I'm really thankful you've taken the time to watch these broadcasts of ours where we're teaching and putting the good news of Jesus Christ forward. I'd love to get connected with you. I know there are hundreds of people that I don't know yet who watch our material and I'd love to get connected with you to either help you with questions you might have about your faith, to help you get connected to use your gifts in ministry, and, uh, and to see what we could possibly do together to see the Lord do great things in our city and beyond. And so it's an easy way for you to get connected to us is by going on our website at regalchurch.com or emailing uh, us at the office at regalchurch.com uh, your information. We have an electronic communication card on our website. You can get connected to us on Facebook via Messenger and other things like that. So we encourage you that uh, you've watched it. Now let's get connected and see what God can do with you and me in the future as we go ahead. Now, for those of us who believe in the mission of Jesus Christ and want to see it go forward, I want to encourage you that we know that the Bible teaches us to use our time, talent, and treasures to make sure that this good news of Jesus Christ and lots of help goes out to the world. And so with that, uh, we have an email where you can give an email money transfer or hit the address to the church that you can uh, send a check or drop by on church on Sunday. We don't ask offering from our guests, nor do we ask it from those who don't believe. It is a privilege that we as Christians get to give joyfully and be a part of God's mission. That one day when we go to heaven, God is going to point out people that because of our efforts that we helped to get them to heaven. So I uh, encourage you to do this. Generosity is something that uh, many of us do here at the church in order to make sure that this gospel goes out from us. It came to us at a high price. So let's see it, that we can be faithful stewards of this message of Jesus Christ and the love that comes from helping others along the way to see that this gets done and modeled for many others in the days and years ahead. I want to give a heartfelt thanks for those that do give. Your sacrificial giving has made a difference and has reached thousands.